Hello and welcome to another episode of Infobots and continuation of my audiobook, SETI. I'm your host, author Frederick Fishman, and today we are sponsored by me. So for links to all of my books, apparel, and gear, go to my main website at infobots.com. Spell with two T's at the end. That's infobots.com. You can also help us out and show your support by visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash infobots podcast. And please check out our new educational membership website packed with numerous multimedia elements about the animal kingdom at animals, that's plural, animals-central.com. That's animals-central.com. Okay, let's get started. Chapter 3 Sam, you're running late. Breakfast is ready. Come on. Dark became light. Silence became sound. Comfort became discomfort. Aunt Marion's voice rattled through Sam's head like rolling thunder. He opened his eyes as the first blast of morning sunlight smashed into his face. He sat up quickly to face an exceptionally bright morning. Sam looked through half-lidded eyes and found himself still lying on the chaise lounge on the roof. He could have cared less about his antennas or anything else at that moment. His mouth was bitter, his joints were stiff, and he was soaked with dew. He stood up slowly and almost tumbled back into the chaise. He bent over to stretch. He reached up to the deep blue morning sky to stretch again. He yawned and slowly made his way to the trap door leading into his room. Sam descended the wooden ladder and closed the trap door. He hopped down the final step and landed in the middle of the room. He rubbed his head and slipped off his jacket as he walked towards his wall of equipment. Stretching from side to side of the huge open room to the other was a combination workbench and equipment stack that Sam had constructed. Directly behind the equipment was a floor-to-ceiling window facing east toward the clearly visible desert hills. Dominating the equipment stack was a bank of computer monitors and associated computer equipment. To the side were at least eight radio receivers and amplifiers of all makes and models. Overhead, the large feed-through conduit opened into his room. A tangled mass of cables splayed in every direction like spaghetti. Clocks of various sizes and display formats gave time in sidereal, UTC, Pacific, Eastern, and 24-hour formats. Pegboards held electronic tools and supplies for every conceivable purpose. Work lamps hung from the ceiling and were clamped onto the heavy desktop. The remainder of the room was sparsely furnished with bedroom basics, a bed, a dresser, a mirror. Next to Sam's bed was a nightstand. On it, a black and white picture of Sam's parents' 
standing next to a small Cessna airplane. A general coverage shortwave receiver switched on, and the rhythmic time tone of WWV could be heard. The monotone recorded voice of the time station jarred Sam into full consciousness. At the tone, 15 hours, 9 minutes, coordinated universal time. Sam glanced at his watch. Oh shit, he said softly. Another general coverage receiver switched on. And that's the summary of the news. You're listening to the World Service of the BBC. We now look at... Sam reached for the volume knob and turned it down. He was late and didn't give a damn what the announcer with the stiff British accent wanted to look at. Sam stepped into the bathroom as still another piece of equipment switched on. It was an ordinary television set. The screen filled with the images of a morning talk show. Three middle-aged women were sitting behind a beautiful hostess and an even more beautiful host. Sam could hear the audio through the intermittent flows of sink water and flushing toilet water. Okay, we're back now on AM San Diego, where this morning, now 12 minutes after the hour, oh shit, Sam screamed through his mouth full of toothpaste, with three interesting frightened ladies who say they were abducted, or at least they think they were abducted by UFOs. Sam turned into a wild man as he flew through the bathroom door and towards his dresser. He tore off his pants and shirt and slipped on fresh clothing, all while stumbling and occasionally cursing at a button that wouldn't button or a jean snap that wouldn't snap. Going on with you, Mrs. Webster, you say that you were then carried or placed on the examination table inside the craft, correct? The host asked in serious tones. Mrs. Webster, distracted by memory, sniffed once as she continued her tale. Sam glanced at the monitor as he put on a dry pair of sneakers and started to collect his books from the workbench. It was horrible, just horrible. First the long needle in my stomach, like a huge shot, and then one of them stuck a device at the base of my skull. Mrs. Webster began to cry, then sobbed. A horrible purple flash filled my head and eyes. Mrs. Webster became nearly hysterical. This caught Sam's emotionless attention. He held on to one of his books as he stared at the television. I begged them to stop. Oh, God, sweet Jesus, please make them stop, Sam smirked. Okay, lady, if Jesus won't, I will. He punched in the power switch. The screen went blank and the hysterical crying ceased. Sam grabbed his notebook and started to turn to the door then took a quick step toward the printer. He ripped off the protruding sheet and folded it quickly and stuffed it into his shirt pocket. He was in such a hurry that he failed to see the frozen graph with a dominating spike still in full view on his dedicated SETI computer monitor. He rushed out the door and bounded down the attached staircase. Aunt Marion pushed aside the condiment tray on the kitchen table to make room for a plate of scrambled eggs. Stu, a somewhat squat man with a benign, quiet personality, was engrossed in the sports section of his morning paper. He ignored his twin blonde daughters, Cindy and Mindy, as they squealed and laughed loudly. Slender, cute Sarah was carefully reading the product description on the panel of a cereal box. She occasionally ate a spoonful of nondescript brown flakes. Mom, Sarah said, listen to this. Do you know that there are 250 milligrams of sodium in this cereal and damn near one cup of sugar in this shit? Stu looked up from his newspaper. Sarah, please, watch your language. The twins were delighted. Yeah, it sounds like crap, Cindy added. Both girls burst into laughter. Ladies, Marion pleaded as she loaded the dishwasher. Cindy and Mindy then grabbed the milk carton at the same instant. Mine, 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 Cindy screamed. It's mine, damn it, Mindy shouted back. Stu looked up, reached over the girls' heads and grabbed the milk and sat at the table. Stu looked up, 
Marion reached over the girls' heads and grabbed the milk and sat at the table. She poured a bit into her empty glass. Now it's mine, she said, glaring at them both. Then she whispered to Mindy, and watch your mouth, young lady. Sam opened the outside door and walked in quickly. Good morning. I hear everything is normal. Marion watched Sam as he grabbed a piece of toast and started to walk out of the kitchen into the dining room. Hi, everybody. Bye, everybody, Sam said quickly. Sam, Marion asked. Sam stopped near the door, then stuck his head around the corner. Yes, Aunt Marion, Sam said sheepishly. Marion stared straight into Sam's eyes. You did it again, didn't you? Uh, you fell asleep on the roof, right? Uh, gotta go, Aunt Marion, I'm late. Sam disappeared through the front door. The family sat quietly as they heard a crash of books and scattering of papers. Shit, Sam screamed. Cindy turned to Stu in an innocent voice, said, See, Daddy, Sammy does it too. Eat, Marion shot back. Sam ran from the house and jumped into his four-wheel drive Jeep Cherokee. The roof of his vehicle was crammed with antennas. Between the driver's and passenger seats, mobile and portable radios were stacked six deep. Switches and meters lined a section of the dashboard. Sam had done some major radio equipment installation. He deactivated the alarm system and sped away from the quiet suburban street. Weaving in and out of heavy traffic, Sam turned up the volume on his amplified radio. Weaving in and out of heavy traffic, Sam turned up the volume on his amplified radio. The rock group, Sting, could be heard a block away, mixed with monotonous beeps and tones of the WWV radio time signal. The school parking lot was quiet as Sam found one remaining parking spot in the rear. He was late again. He knew it. The excuse would have to be good this time. He tried to think of one as he set the alarm system on his car. As Sam walked quickly toward the school entrance, he suddenly remembered the piece of a computer paper he had stuffed into his pocket. He pulled it out and read it quickly. He saw the graph and he looked at the text below. Sam froze in his tracks as he read the message that would change mankind's concept of itself and its place in the universe. It would be the most important message that man on this planet had ever received. And there he was, Sam Alexander, late for his first period biology class. He read the message again, looked at the graph. Was this a mistake? Or this time, was it for real? The hair in the back of his neck rose. He felt the chill of goosebumps all over his body. The message read, A signal of unknown origin has been detected. Please notify control operator immediately. A signal of unknown origin has been detected. Please notify control operator immediately. A signal of unknown origin. 